I think the usefulness of the natives has uh, gone downhill to the point where it's gone. I no longer have enough troops that a maneuver action can really get rid of much of this disorder. I could get rid of one here or one here or one here. I only have one extra unit. I'm not allowed to abandon areas though with these guys unless I have a card that allows that. If I did, ooh, I have this mi uh, mass migration. So I can consolidate my empire and reduce the uh, disorder factors. And by doing that, <coughs> um, I'll then be able to still score points or something. <sighs> because as things stand, they can't, I, I was considering destroying the empire uh, simply because it doesn't work. Now one interesting question is what the hell happens to disorders if a place is taken over or if uh, if you abandon it, just, just sit it there and remain as a problem because it's not, obviously the game does not imply that the areas where there's no one there are truly empty. There are people in most of these areas. <laughs> I'm unable to find a reference to that in the rules. Of course, I didn't look terribly hard. I'm tired of reading these rules again and again and again. Um, one thing in particular, though, is when you attack an area and take it, there seems to be no indication that the area disorder marker, the attack conflict disorder markers, uh, would, you know, the penalties against particular armies, those disappear. But the area's disorder seems to remain there. Um, so I think if you leave an area, you'll leave it in disorder. And if somebody wants to conquer it, that's their problem to resolve that then. That could be really problematic in terms of, you know, these kind of valuable areas. You don't want to have them not, you don't want to have to pay extra essentially to reconquer them. Although it's not a big extra when you're just using a maneuver action. So I'm going to pick a maneuver for them. I got no idea what I'm doing for everything else. But I did want to point out that kind of interesting choice. If I didn't have that card, I would have been putting this empire into the discard pile because it has no hope, really. Uh, I can't tax value in a valuable fashion because I don't have feudalism. Although I could pick that up from the Danes and get an advantage that way. Oh, neat. They have their homeland back. I hope I scored that correctly. Uh, I think I did. Um, and, you know, if they did the civilized, did the feudal option, then they would have some building capabilities and could come up uh, into this. But uh, if they did feudalism, they'd be picking, they'd be having to get rid of democracy, and I think that throws uh, disorder in every space. <laughs> Tough decision here, keeping the Saxons alive another turn. I have something very pleasing here, the Spanish. Um, you can see they get a point for their homeland, which they'll probably start with right away. So I'll take a decrease in points, you know, I'll only be getting one point there. Um, but if I can make them Christian, which I can on the first civilized action I take, and then start expanding outside of Europe. They don't have any terrible advantage for that. I'm no longer in era four though. I'm in era five for the world, which means that I'm not gonna get the advantages that the, of the era for the Spanish. Columbus and Magellan are gonna be interesting then. And I'm kind of surprised there aren't any uh, Pizarro and, and Cortez or something like that. Uh, I haven't looked at the Columbus and Magellan pieces, but you'd expect that they're just explorers, when what you really kind of want is someone with good military capabilities. But I don't know. Um, and then, uh, well, this other one doesn't look as interesting. But what I noticed is, you know, I got my full four points for Saxony. Four points is pretty good for a country. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to maintain that with Spain. And I actually think I probably can for a while longer with the Saxons. Um, obviously, the Vikings would be my main threat there, I guess. But uh, 
and we could see, I mean, the Irish could put a boat out here or something, and that would be a problem. The Vikings are a particular problem because they have a philosopher, so if they get a boat, if they defeat me navally, I've got a problem. Um, I wanted to go back to that first guy I was looking at. He has a really interesting nation that he was considering starting until I realized, uh, age three only. Um, Starts out with a fort, it's these assassins. Can civil, uh, during civilized, can take a free assassination action. And each time he is successfully kills something, uh, a leader, he gets two. And I assume this is only on his free action, not. Or if he plays an assassin card uh, from this empire. But he gets two for each leader he successfully kills. Um, his points as a kingdom aren't very good. This is kind of like the step nomads in these. Big player games where glory may or may not be happening on most turns. Other ways to get glory become more and more valuable. So that would have been a very, very interesting um, uh, empire to start. People who've gotten it haven't been in a position to start an empire before. Or we were in era four for most of the game, really. Um, you got to remember this started in era three, right? <laughs> you know, uh, the game is beginning to settle down and make more sense with a lot of pieces on the board. I really wish I had started in Era 1. I feel like the game is almost, you know, completely pointless, if except as a game, if you play it uh, in any starting in anything but Era 1. I think that historical starting point is a requirement for me to play this game and get uh, any, any value out of it, really. Um, I had been worried about that, but I wanted to look into those starting positions. What I don't know is how realistic it is what, if you start in that position. I think it's going to be a lot better. Uh, but, you know, there are situations like these Arabs who never got an Islam card and eventually decided, well, I need Christianity because it, even though it doesn't give me glory points, at least I get, you know, the one glory point for uh, getting it, and then I get more uh, from the... I get some advantages from the religion itself as well, even if I'm not using the religion I'd want. If I get an Islam card, I may well convert at the huge cost that that's going to be. Something I missed when I moved up there into the new progress, the religious strife goes away. So, here is a gripe. I've started the Portuguese as an umpire. And they have a, a little minus two setup. So they start quite far along. But my understanding of the way the game from the cards that I've seen, etc., seems to work. The European powers have a lower minus. And that means they're going to progress more quickly. Now, Organically, we have seen the progress happening in this area. This is where it seems like the kinds of things that made Europe great are actually happening, you know, in terms of uh, a more expansive economies and, 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 and civilizations, etc. Are the kinds of things that seem to be happening here. You have your democracy forming there. Yes, the religions are fixed to a location, but... Uh, it just kind of disturbs me that Europe, which has largely been backwards, very backwards, you've got the Saxons covering most of it way back here, the Vikings not terribly far ahead uh, over there. It almost feels to me uh -oh, like uh, different powers, you know, that sort of the nature of the world is not the history that we had. So it seems wrong that the uh, new empire showing up should necessarily be more advanced in Europe at this point than they would be in other areas. I don't know how you would fix that, but something feels discontinuous here uh, in, in the sense that this world seems to have its own logic to it, the world of this particular game and that logic doesn't seem to include for great advances happening out in little 
you know, podunk countries <laughs> on the edge of Europe. Um, there were reasons that the European tradition made sense that it would advance. I almost feel like uh, this number, the advanced number, should be based on empires within a certain range, perhaps, uh, uh, and, and this might be a reasonable modification, empires within a certain range, perhaps the age range of the time uh, of you, are what you can pick. So, for example, Portugal would not be learning from these Javanese back here. Just like Europe took a long time to assimilate the uh, Eastern knowledge, um, so it didn't jump start. Of course, to get that right, you'd have to tweak all of the setup numbers. They would have to be changed because um, you wouldn't want to penalize the East too much if it's falling behind. It's already got big negatives on, on its uh, on its territories. And likewise, the African nations have big negatives on them. What if Africa was the hotbed of progress in the game? You know, so you would have to do more than just make this rule saying, hey, you know, you pick off, you, you only get your technology off the nation that uh, is near you. You'd also have to uh, do a lot of balancing and, and, you know, thought to get those numbers to work right so that you could have areas of great uh, economic and, and civilization progress being less related to the actual history and more to the circumstances of the game. There's another problem with that too. China was very advanced. But many of the areas around it were not particularly advanced in the same way. Uh, the great empire that China had was able to promote a certain kind of advancement. So it all becomes much, much more tricky. And I, I just feel like you'd have to do a significant redesign to get this to work correctly. You know, it might have to relate to uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of, culture there is there in terms of religion and government in the more advanced society to see whether it flows and what there's going to be in the others. It just all becomes very, very complex. Here's another thing. You don't inherit religions. So the Portuguese are not inherently Christian, even though they show up in an era uh, yeah, so I'm not saying they should be. If anything, they should be taking from what they're growing out of. But perhaps you should have the option to pick up whatever uh, uh, governments and uh, religions are in your area just as you start. I'm going to make sure that's not in here because that actually strikes me as more sensible um, than this kind of jumping into play. Yeah, there's no such luck. And let me make sure the Portuguese don't have anything special. Ooh, oh, we're not in age four anymore. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have Portugal. They knocked away the Vikings very easily. Uh, you know, you have a huge stack of pieces, uh, in this case, a 12 point production with some fairly higher advanced technologies coming into play, just blowing their way away. And, you know, this is not that terrible, right? Here we see the Vikings who were there, one, two, three, we're at plus four on them. So, yes, there's been a significant move. Now, one thing to note, though, there's been almost no contact with the East. The closest we're having with that is the Russians. So how the Portuguese advance so quickly might be somewhat suspect. But, yeah, I'm not completely unwilling to accept that. On to another age question. Does it make sense to be able to exploit wheat or oil 
based on the worldwide age or only your umpire's age? You know, it's just that one issue is such a, a telling problem that the rules don't make it specific which one is in under application. Um, obviously, again, from my reasoned point of view, that seems to apply to the umpire uh, as opposed to the world. But does it really make sense? Because some of those advances spread more quickly. So, for example, oil. Modern oil industry has been able to exploit countries and produce oil in a way that maybe they shouldn't fit in this final age in terms of the other stuff that they could produce. So if we look at the oil, it's only in age seven. Now when you're in age seven, you could build the internet, okay? However, oil is exploited, theoretically it was exploited before this kind of 1918 cutoff, but okay. It was exploited as an important commodity uh, starting in about that era. So, you know, it, it, it really hit its true value later on. So, I can accept that, but does it really make sense in that sense? Uh, you know, you had areas in the Near East producing oil in the Between the Wars era, when really the countries there were not in any position to particularly build the types of units involved, nor were they in the position to build the internet or something else. And I, I just don't know. Uh, the growing, well, again, certainly better agricultural techniques may have spread faster than some other aspects, but that's a little harder to, to define, to make a real argument uh, for, as opposed to multinationals going and drilling the oil, building up the industry, and then the nation kind of catching up through the, uh, the period. Um, there's no mechanism that would make sense for that because the contact with those oil companies would more or less push the country into the more modern age. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that w this particular feature is based on what the player's empire is based on. The other things, though, I feel like trade advantages, for example, don't make a lot of sense if it's just based on the, uh, on the empire's age, that progressing with the empire doesn't necessarily restrict your trade. The one instance that I can think of where you'd have something like that, where the progress of the empire itself changed its ability to interact with the exterior world, and actually negatively, is with China. Uh, China progressed and made a decision not to expand their trade, their naval uh, aspects. Oh boy, so bad. I turned to the rules. Imagine that. And it does actually state when the empire is in certain ages. As opposed to this age. So that seems pretty specific. Like, um, what, there was a prior one to remember what it was. Oh, with the artifacts where it actually specified the empire being in the age. So I, I think I'm actually playing it correctly that they actually covered uh, the bases on that one. It just would have been nice to clarify it more because it definitely caused some confusion on my end initially. And the production in mind that I was particularly worried about there was, I think, these... Yeah, I'm not seeing them sitting on any... Oh no, yeah, they have the wheat here. So I was worried that maybe they should be gaining that because we are in age five. All right, so now, I kind of screwed up here 
Uh, forgot to do a start empire. Again, I play very loosely. If you did this in an opposed game where people were being very strict, uh, once people started their production, and in particular this with the Saxons doing their production, so I allowed them a chance to fix it. You wouldn't be allowed to start an empire out of turn, as it were. But um, in a game like this, I believe in being a little bit more flexible because that was planned on and it's you know my mind can't keep track of everything for all the countries very well uh, anyway we have the start of the venetians and we have a buildup of new high-tech viking sailing ships and also expansion over uh in terms of troop growth in the americas um, the high-tech sailing ships why well because i get points for britain if i can get control of that and then the um, external to Europe is where I want to do my expansion. In particular, I can do kind of cheap expansion down here and just keep doubling the size of my South American holdings. I can also get a nice rich place there. Um, I'm still dealing with a feudal society. <laughs> that doesn't go away. And that's, you know, economically still a good idea for the Vikings because they have a lot of military kind of giving up on these those are probably going to fall there's too many rich new exciting empires that are in play there in fact the venetians are the level one empire now they have exceeded uh, java in terms of uh, the technology and they have some neat bonuses here uh, money they got a pile of money i hopefully actually moved it back down i'm going to be getting a leader no no because i'm in era five so i can't get galileo and I can't get Polo. Um, and I couldn't play this either. Shit. Alright, well, we'll take them off and start a different empire. Shit. Instead, we got a much less interesting empire, the Hausa here. We're going to be competing with, I guess, my Benin. Um, these guys only started with 14 money. A lot of infantry there. It's going to be able to ca carve out a pretty good space there. Their special ability is that uh, essentially they can count uh, desert and harvest. And in production, if I can read this, uh, I see the word production and it looks like desert. Um, they also get our earned income um, from the difference between total trade values when they win a trade. Uh, they have... For victory conditions, not a lot of points here. They're probably gonna they're probably gonna be able to hold on to their home. I'd say they're gonna get second in Africa fairly easily, so that's another point. So that's only two points. And then they can start stockpiling capital. And that's kinda neat because you don't have to do much. The only other option I had was the pirate states. They will probably never get points for the turns for the most part, but uh, they get one per conflict, one in sea and ocean areas. They could pretty much probably shut down somebody's navies. So, for example, if they started somewhere like here, the navies probably won't go out to sea just to prevent them from getting points. These guys are doing fairly well, uh, so you might see that kind of activity. It might have been more valuable to start somewhere like Norway or something and, and try to hunt because there does seem to be a naval war going on. The problem with that is they had a one, two, three, four, five space hurt. Well, they would have been able to buy the good new modern ships. But I'm seeing this as more likely to make points. It's hard to tell whether or not you're going to get those end of turn points, though. Remember, sometimes, quite often, they seem to just not happen. In which case, you know, every turn making a point in battle, which is about what I'd say would happen from a naval battles, would be kind of nice. Anyway, uh, I think I did the production for these guys, and now we go down to trade and progress. And I'm screwing up left and right. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I'm just really kind of distracted and fatigued in a lot of ways. Um, my pattern should be pretty established by now, but taking a day more or less off yesterday really threw a wrench in this whole process.
Bannon keeps trying the same trade against the Vikings. Um, I guess they could go after the Irish instead at this point. Maybe? What is our range? No, our range is only two, so we have trouble reaching most things. We could have gone after these suckers, though. How were they? Their trades is zero, so that would have been equal to the Vikings. And they just keep losing, and it's pushing the Vikings further and further along into actually becoming something of a viable nation without having to work for it. We had a decent number of maneuvers. Uh, the North Americans pulled out, fixed some of their disorder. They still got some kicking around down here that they're not coping with. Had to leave this guy down here because he's stuck. Kind of spread out a little bit. Uh, not the best of circumstances, but if I do a production, I want the most money I can have. Still got this damn uh, revolution going on. That'll continue until I can pump up there, basically, unless something else like socialism occurs. Um, Irish took boats out of Ireland, slammed into here, and marched down the Italian boot into Sicily, but then you can see the Arabs came up against them, actually captured the Italian stuff. They also marched through here. Largely were successful until they hit this space where they finally lost their elite marker. They haven't been fighting much. Um, they basically were trying to cut their way through to maybe knock the Portuguese capital out or something. Um, they're looking to hunt blue, and blue is tough for them to get to. Uh, we'll see if we got more cutting around on the second half of the board, really. That includes up to We're going into the second round of combat here. I think the uh, Tang are going to pull out of Hope Bay. Um, they have advantages. They have two points of advantage from the terrain, but the problem is both sides have a disorder marker on them now. I'm looking at facing nine units. We've had two rounds of combat, one one each way. I'm looking at facing nine unit, nine points. That's doubled to 18 to my 8, 9, 10 because the terrain doesn't get doubled. That's a, a level of difference that I can't really face. So I'm going to pull out of there. I'm not sure that's good, not because, oh, hey, I would have had a chance to win, but more along the lines of... Maybe I would rather lose the pace than retreat into this kind of dense position. Hard to tell for sure. I can't think of a great reason why I'd want to lose the pace. I'm going to have to launch a counterattack now. Oh. But as we can see here, I actually have a maneuver. So I'll be able to do that right away. Interesting maneuvers. Um, our Indians, whatever they're called, have spread their way both into Africa and Australia. Australia is especially interesting to them because, well, maybe not to them. It's part of Asia, uh, but in their case, they're interested in it because of the fertile territories um, where they can continue to build up forces there. They've also spread out their navies, pushed here, and... This is their elephant, that's right. They're preparing themselves for an attack on Blue's uh, Vietnamese. Again, Blue is still in the lead, so... And Purple's the one closest on their heels, although everyone else is kind of caught up with them. Then over here, the Tang pushed forward, and they took out the Sung capital. And that's... That may be the end of the Sung. Um, that was a risky move for them to attack the way they did, splitting the Tang. The Tang were able to hit them from multiple directions. Uh, I was hoping to use this big old boat to transport stuff over to Honshu, get an additional fertile area, but it's more important to me with the uh, Tang, wherever they are, uh, to get control of China and to be, well, I'm going to be in Asia either way, but getting that extra point in China is going to be worthwhile. Um, and that moves us to the destiny. So far, the uh, um, civilized actions haven't been very effective in this turn. The Vietnamese did it, and, you know, they increased one of their cities. This is, by the way, an empty three-point city, a real tempting target. 
nobody had a maneuver to take advantage of it. Um, over here, nothing. The next one down here was the Khmer, who improved to the best city in the world so far. Uh, there were some attempts at doing bad, nasty things to people, but none of them worked. But then we got to Java, and they had one that did. Uh, they played democracy on themselves, getting themselves a glory. They don't particularly want democracy, but they want the point. Um, democracy's not terrible. It's just, oh, we've been seeing um, Hinduism spread, too. So the Khmer picked Hinduism up. They actually had the Buddhism card. Um, but they wanted to use it for something else. I don't remember what it was. Do they still have it in their hand? In which case, maybe they made the wrong move. No, they must have played it for something. Ah, uh, uh, silver mine, get them some cash. Buddhism's probably the best of the religions in the sense that it doesn't come with a penalty. And it's got kind of this cool ability to get rid of disorder which is really pleasant, and other people become disordered when they capture you. So it's overall a very, very nice little religion, but uh, I don't know. Ten bucks versus, versus the possibility of another point of, well, versus another point of glory. I don't know if they made the right choice there. Um, especially, well... They want the most artifacts, but right now they have four. They would have had four either way, so they're getting the glory for that. Basically what they're looking at is to keep the Khmer alive. Um, they're going to need to build troops, and they need the cash. So it's kind of a... both options were good. Anyway, once we get to Java, uh, they played the democracy, like I said, choosing not to play the busted to drain Blue's hand. And then they played this for a chaos... Destroying the Great Wall here. Now that's set their progress back one. Not a big deal. There wasn't really anything that they could do um, that seemed more appropriate, to tell you the truth. That's the problem. Um, and this card isn't really helping them. So they went with that, but they also uh, upgraded their own city, ended up with a leader. A few good things there. Um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think that's it for the civilizing actions. So, uh, I don't think anyone's being discarded this round. So I guess we go to the, uh, progress and scoring. Just special glory cards were played. The green player had the choice... of either adding, uh, either doubling glory or having it for everyone. They decided to double it for everyone. They could have done neither as well. Because they think they're kind of in a good position point-wise and maybe some other people are not. You can't pre-calculate everybody's glory before you make that decision. You kind of have to make it on a gut decision. And they're looking and saying, I'm gonna pull in good points this turn. However, uh, the Arab player and the African um, played this I am t truly glorious which allows him to double his that would be a quadruple for one of his empires and that was cancelled with this bad augury um, which you know you don't want to let somebody get that kind of advantage they're not that far <laughs> out of you know they're towards the, the top of the secondary pack there um, so now I'll just calculate these out if I can Remember to double everyone's. And that deal probably largely worked out well. Green is now, you can see the glory has spread out a lot. Gray is the new leader. With their strong positions still here, they're getting four points here. That doubles to eight. And then I think about the same here uh, for being the largest in Southeast Asia. Now that Java's been knocked down a little bit there. They pulled in a lot of points with the blue player having just started a new country and kind of languishing a bit, especially in this area. They weren't able to, and actually they lost the lead in the Americas.
because the disorder, oh, this isn't in disorder. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're tied. That's a problem. Uh, Pink's got a philosopher, so they came in second, so went right correctly, anyhow. Okay. Um, so they weren't able to make the kind of points that they kind of needed to stay even just in the lead. Gray made a humongous leap forward. But green made one too. Right now the red is really lagging behind. Um, they're just not cranking the points that they need to. And with this being a double risk turn essentially, uh, you definitely saw some significant shake up in those scores. And there was a nice little pack with a couple people trailing and one person way ahead. Now, you know, there's a closer race for first, but more more spread among the the powers that uh, that are in the lesser positions. But you can see, you know, the cards, etc., make it pretty easy to make big jumps or not move at all. You don't really know what's going to happen <laughs> when they start coming. Production: the Russians continue building up their thickness over in Asia. That's where their biggest points are. They don't expect the Saxons to make much of a move against them. Uh, they're not exactly in, the, you know, in a leading position, so they're kind of hoping to kind of slip by the radar there, even though they've gained some serious ground. Uh, Benin did production. A lot of boats in here. Plans to push out, get more productive capability, or whatever, you know. Um, it gives them more military power overall, and they could push towards, uh, you know, things like the Cape and try to develop some of the uh, some of the fertile land down there. Um, I'm not sure that's what they're going to do. The Khmer, big production. They had some money in the bank left, and you can see they built some big ships, planning on taking the Javans on, sort of head on. Right now, Java is the leading. Um, technological force here and they're kind of getting towards where they're going to start getting cooler and cooler stuff it would be kind of cool from uh the chimera's point of view if they could knock java out of the game before they push on too much further uh, again though they're not really something to worry about but gray wants to get its points that's kind of its key it could just transport all over southeast asia but in the long run um this game kind of favors the attacker in some ways, just because the defender's going to have weak spots. But if you can hit the defense early, uh, you can take away his ability to do as much. No production here for orange, nor for purple. Uh, for purple, I've got... Uh, is this the one? No, it's orange that has this... The Sung, I put a wild card on. Now, production is probably what I'd want to do, but I kind of want to see what else is going on. Um, I, my intention is to discard the umpire, but I may at least wait until I get my destiny card. Maybe I'll do a civilize instead to keep myself alive. Uh, the problem with that, of course, well, I'm probably not going to advance anyway. Um, and then the final production is with the Plains Americans who built up some decent infantry and in cav. Um, they get an advantage if they can hit those uh, Vikings who have a higher progress. They can get some glory off that. So if they can counterattack, that's what they'd like to do. They'd also like to be certain that they're in the lead in Americas again. Uh, that would kind of solidify their point values. All right, that moves on. This is the first time we've seen someone pick the trade in progress and hit someone else who's picked it. Uh, the Irish ended up beating the Saxons on this, and since they were below the Saxons, they actually moved up three spaces. Um, but now the Saxon action is wiped out by that. It's really a dangerous pick uh, in so many ways. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has got it. The Sung aren't going to throw that in yet.
Oh, we got another one with the tag. Weapons are potent, but they ain't gods. Uh, the house uh, moved up into here. I swapped my calf through to Carthage so that it didn't face the elephant who penalizes their ratings. And then the infantry uh, was able to wipe out the elephant and its supporting unit. On the maneuver side. Uh, trying to see if anything happened that I'm uh, not thinking of. So after the house uh, moved, uh, that's really where we are. The Vikings then kind of spread out. They made it all the way down here to Argentina. You'll see they're not there. They swept through North America. They took the North Sea from the Saxons. That gives them the Britain bonus. Um, even if they weren't present, if nothing was present. But they've got this technological edge on almost everything they're fighting. So they're in pretty good shape. But one thing they don't have an edge on is the Portuguese who sailed down and grabbed Argentina from them. And this serves kind of a dual purpose. It didn't succeed yet, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to one, two, three, four, five, by attacking Viking settlements in South America, they're kind of reducing the total number of Vikings present in the Americas, which is important for the natives. It's also eventually to their advantage. The Portuguese have a, I want to own as much of the uh, non-European world as I can in comparison to other European powers. And the only other European power that's really interested in that right now is the Vikings. But I got a question whether the Russians count in this game. Um, if they do, they're slamming everyone down and they, the Vikings shouldn't have been getting the number of points they've been getting. So I'm going to have to look at how that's actually worded. It may only be a competition among people who have this little outside Europe symbol. That's the case. So the Russians aren't in that competition. The Irish aren't in that competition. If they went over and started colonizing huge hunks of North America, uh, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> they could not be one of the colonial powers in competition for that. So, yeah, the Portuguese are beginning to work their way up. They'll be, since they're outside of Europe now and they have a two-pointer in that, I believe, they'll be getting a point from, I'm sorry, from here. They'll be getting a point from that and a point from this. So two points for the turn, which is kind of nice. For, for a, a, a second turn on the board, that's not that bad. They don't have a lot of pieces to begin with, unlike some empires that get to start out. The only question is whether they should have went and tried to hit the uh, the territory well, the territory is up in the north and taken pressure off more directly, um, military as well as the economic uh, or the victory point pressure. The problem with that is, hey, this is a really valuable territory. It's worth five production points. And the Portuguese don't have a lot of production coming to them. Um, they only have, what, three outside of that. So that gives them eight. They'd be producing four points. That's enough for one unit. Um, they kind of need that kind of wealth. If they attacked over here, First of all, they'd be facing some defensive penalties, but that didn't matter with what they were hitting it with. That's nice modern uh, navy there, which would have been able to do quite a bit. The Arabs decide to unleash chaos by bringing Islam into effect on them. Uh, they had Christianity already. <laughs> it didn't do them all that much good, to tell you the truth. They probably shouldn't have taken it, but they got a glory off of it. But they definitely want Islam because that's their biggest goal. They get three points this turn for being the biggest Islamic empire. Of course, other people might take it over, and with all the disorder they got on all their earlier cities, um, it's a problem. They did manage to build a couple more cities, but that was the biggie, is they want that three extra points, plus they get a point for incorporating Islam. Um, so they've got some nice factors in, in play for that. Uh, we'll see if they can survive changing religions, though. It's going to be really, really tough. They don't have enough money to buy off even one of their disorder spaces. It's seven bucks a space, so they're going to have to do it with maneuver or else do a production, which they could have incorporated feudalism, which would have uh, been kind of a short-term answer, but not a very good long-term answer. 
And given that they get from Islam, I believe it's one glory for every territory that they take from a non-Islamic empire, it makes everybody near them kind of want to go Islamic <laughs> or stop them. I was planning on sinking the sun. And I saw this Buddhism card, and I said, you know, I could get a quick glory off Buddhism. Who knows if anything's going to happen there. Let's look up and see what Buddhism does. Well, the first thing I looked up is, I've got to be within range of India. Now, you could say I'm one, two away. That's easily within range. The problem is, I'd have to get permission from this empire or these two empires to reach. And navally, it's one, two, three. Yeah, I just don't reach it. Uh, so, I'm going to keep going with my sinking with an eventual plan to become England, I think. Only other people doing in any kind of uh, uh, civilization action were the Indians. They took a pause to do so, built a forum so that they got a victory point off that, got themselves a strategist here that'll maybe help them. Uh, they attempted an assassination on the Vietnamese that didn't work. And, uh, well, we got at least one discard in play. I think that's it. Yeah, I think this is our only discard. And we're going to see the English show up, I believe. In fact, we're going to see it right away because he has the Phoenix card. And there's England starting with a humongous stack. Maybe people wouldn't have been happy about this, most especially the Vikings, if they knew which empire was getting started here. Um... Let me see if they have. Nobody's terribly upset about them getting an empire. But there is a card that can prevent an empire from starting. Um, one, what's Favor of the Gods? The Start of Destiny. You get more cards. That's not worth wasting a Vizier type card on. Um, so this is the first time I think we've seen the Vikings that were there, their pieces converted into English, and then the English got this bonus. Uh, they're able to build their ships at only three bucks each in this realm. They get a plus one front line and support value on their ships. Their glory values are going to be holding where they are, uh, expanding outside Europe. So now there's a third power involved in that. Money and the most ships. So they just built a shitload of ships basically and a couple of these uh, these riflemen as well or musketeers which uh, they're they're a fairly potent force to be reckoned with at this point with the capability to sail just about anywhere they like and of course they're not terribly interested in uh, in Britain itself actually uh, except to defend it they don't want to lose their capital space um, so now we go to progress and uh, the Irish or the Russians have not this card right. oh, I thought they had a card which allows them to advance yes they have the enlightenment card which is going to allow them to advance uh, one of those two I don't know which one um, I kind of like moving the Irish forward Especially now that they are the most Christian nation left, with uh, the Arabs having left the faith. Okay, and in the victory point uh, divisions, things are kind of crazy here. Lots of cards played. First, uh, the Glory Pour Moi, that got cancelled outright over there. Then the Expanded Glory was played by these guys. I still haven't done everything. I think I'm going to throw this uh, glorious pity. It only gets me a point. It should have gotten more, but I don't want to hold it in my hand. Uh, although that seven point trade card might be fun. Um, the expanded glory got blown back into the Irish, Russians. They, I don't know, they had the same amount of points, like four each. So they got a bigger incorporation of points from that which actually put them in the lead. A little gray really slowed down here. Um, the Saxons... Uh, see, here's the question. The Irish are in second place in England. 
The first place actually still went to the Danes because they have a philosopher. Uh, second place went to the next in line, which would be the, uh, the Irish who were the first player. Uh, so we lost some of our points there. Over here we're still cranking a pretty decent amount uh, for what's down there. But the Saxons are really beginning to look less and less of a valuable empire and I'm probably going to ditch them at this point. I just don't see them as being terribly viable, but we'll see. Um, and let's see. Well, the English obviously haven't met their promise yet and Java is not terribly expanded, but you can see uh, where our progress is. We've got a couple of the empires at the top of the game sort of there, the Chinese and Portuguese also uh, being up there. And well, blue made its way back up into being towards the lead and everybody else kind of really trailing behind pretty badly. Um, although once I restore the Arab state, it should be worth good points. The problem is I'm losing points for not controlling my home area because Medina is under disorder. Uh, no longer one of the biggest in the world. And, well, I don't have the artifacts bonus. That went, I think, down here to the pale gray. They have tons of artifacts. They just got that right now. Oh, uh, I think this one's long enough. I should load it up. 